The political and social philosophy has been improve your standard of living through material well-being. Well, if you're in poverty, that's true. I don't think most people would volunteer for poverty. So we definitely have to improve our economy. I've never said that was a bad value. But when you have so many people and you improve your economy by using cheap, dirty means like uh, internal combustion engines and extensive land use and burning fossil fuels and dumping them in the atmosphere, sending kids to the hospital with asthma and changing the climate, then the very quality of life that you use those technologies to improve starts to become degraded because you've fouled your nest to such an extent that it's a, a, a cure worse than a disease. So what we have to do is leapfrog over those old industrial um, revolution technologies like the sweatshops and the coal burning and the, and, the, and the dirty polluting cars to high technology, to renewable energy. And we have to take a look about, about that. And we have to sit and basically say, the object of growth is not growth itself, it's improved quality of life. And when there's a contradiction that the growth has so many negative side effects that we're driving tens of percent of species into extinction, we're threatening coral reefs, the food chain, uh, and the quality of our own life, well then that's really worse than nothing. So the question then is get off the old paradigm of doing it the old way. And it's not growth per se, it's quality of life that matters. And we have to find the means to continue to improve our quality of life, particularly for people at the bottom of society. But that doesn't necessarily mean more of the old way. That could also mean finding new and better ways to do it. But new and better ways mean different winners and losers in the economic system. And the old way people, the losers, will be screaming and yelling and fighting politically. And the winners, the new way, they don't know it yet. So they're not becoming enough of a political force. So what we have to do inside of the environmental movement is remind people that they are potential winners from clean technology. And it's not just about green, it's also about jobs. But they don't know it, they've got to know it to be able to get on board and send the signals to the politicians to change behavior. Because without that, we're gonna go headlong down the hill with very shaky brakes. Ironically, some people blame corporations for causing trouble because they're only motivated by short-term economic gain and they're not charged for their pollution and their destruction of land. And there's a lot of truth in that. But corporations have also taught us something that we have to remember, which is what's called a high leverage strategy or multiple benefits. That is, if you can take an activity and your change is gonna bring you more than one benefit. So in a company, if they're gonna improve the efficiency of their production process, they're gonna have less pollution, buy less materials, not have the environment is degraded, and lower costs. Of course they're gonna do that. Well, the society can do the same thing. And one of the places where we can use a high leverage, multiple benefit strategy is by protecting primary forests. In particular, tropical forests with very, very high biodiversity. There's a lot of carbon in there. If only we could take the hard hat and the chainsaw out of the hand of the poor person who lives in the forest, because right now that's their easiest way to make an income, feed their families and improve their quality of life, but they can't do that sustainably because once they cut the trees down, now what are they gonna do? So they have a short-term benefit, and in the long run, they're children are left with nothing so and a degraded forest so what we want to do is we want to put a ranger hat on them give them a pair of binoculars and protect the forest and pay them to become stewards of the land well in order to do that we've got to get them some money that money then is used to keep the carbon in the ground 
because those trees represent carbon, which have values of hundreds of dollars a ton. So if we could get international agreements to protect the climate that would get a price on carbon, we'd have money available to keep those people living in the forest working to protect and sustain for their children, grandchildren, and everybody the existence of the forest, maintaining the biodiversity of the forest, and keeping the carbon in the ground. It's a win-win-win. But in order to do that, we first have to have a price for dumping junk in the atmosphere, which requires international agreements with real charges for the polluters who are fighting it, you know, and clawing and scratching to prevent, using every political argument, including lying and deceit and threats of how the economy will collapse, any scare they can use to try to prevent a loss of market share. And as long as that continues, we don't have the cash available to try to pay people to protect the forests rather than to destroy them. So we need the win-wins, but that's only going to happen when we have a planetary climate regime that is charging for carbon that makes funds available that allows us to get the win-win with primary forest protection for carbon, biodiversity, and sustainable jobs. We can do it but we've got to take some global action to get there. Being in favor of having global rules is not necessarily being in favor of global government. It's about global governance. Those are not the same thing. There already is global governance. We have air traffic agreements across every country. The way each country handles air traffic is based on a negotiation where we've given up some national sovereignty in order to have our airplanes land safely somewhere else. Their airplanes have to land safely with us. We make a set of rules. We have shared extradition treaties with other countries. We've made an agreement if their person did something bad to us, we want that person prosecuted in our country, so we give up and give our people to them. You get something for giving something. Every time you agree as an individual to have a traffic light, speed limit, to have doctors regulated, to have airline pilots regulated, you're giving up some degree of personal freedom. This is not exactly a new idea goes back to Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau, you know, 200 years ago. It's called a social contract. It is not absolute freedom to have total capacity to do what you want. Because if your neighbor does what they want and they're more powerful than you or more polluting than you, they're going to hurt you more than the rules are going to hurt you. So you've got to set up rules that protect the commons for health, for environment, for sustainability, for security. This is not a new idea. This is what we've been doing for hundreds of ideas, why we have treaties and alliances. What's new is that it's a side effect of our economic development that's creating pressure at a global scale that now requires global scale governance. You don't have to have everybody turning all their power over to a central government. What you have to have them do is agree to a set of rules where they'll pay into a central pot of money, their pollution fees, where they'll agree to help transfer income to allow poor countries to leapfrog over the Industrial Revolution to high technology. That's governance. We're still going to have our own culture. We're still going to have our own laws. We're still going to have our own rules. What we're going to say is we don't want somebody else's pollution destroying our climate any more than they want our pollution destroying theirs. So we both agree to give up a little sovereignty, just like we agree to step on the brakes at a traffic light, even though it's violent a little bit of personal freedom because if we didn't have those traffic lights the carnage rates on the highways would be a disaster and imagine what they'd be like if there were no cops and judges so you have to have rules the rules have to be enforced they have to be enforced at a larger scale than a national entity but it's not the whole country's lifestyle we're talking about protecting commons that we get back even more than we gave up as does somebody else it's just Planetary hygiene, it's good management. I 
I don't think that global governance involves a single thing. I think the first thing you have to do from the biodiversity point of view is protect your local assets to the extent you can. That means make certain you're managing systems that can be managed, that you're monitoring to find out what's in trouble. That's more of a national local thing. The global part is that other people with perhaps better resources and skills than some of the stewards in the very poorest countries with a tremendous amount of biodiversity who would like to protect it but have neither the skill nor the resources to do that. I think they have the right to ask for foreign assistance without too many strings attached. Some make sure that the money isn't stolen, but you have to have some strings, but not too many. So that's number one. Number two, we have to take a look at where are the hot spots in the world and how can we try to, to get financing to keep them reasonably protected. We have to say as the climate changes, how will those hot spots move out of our protected reserves? And again, we have to try to set up corridors of migration. As ecologists have already told us, we have to try to fund ways to do that. Uh, we may have to pay people whose property has to be specially set up so that they can allow those migrations. And that'll probably require some international actions. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have to stop dumping all our wastes in the atmosphere uh, because if you keep changing the climate, then any reserve you set up is only temporary before it no longer houses the species you're trying to protect. And that's going to require global scale governance where there's a price on carbon. But in addition to price on carbon, we have to help people adapt. We have to help species adapt. We have to have public-private partnerships to fund the new technologies. And that's going to involve loan guarantees and a number of other things that can be both national and international. So there isn't just one thing. There's a whole sequence of steps that we can take. In the end, we have to have polluters paying for what they're doing. But the poorest countries you know, can't afford that, so we have to help them for a period of decades by insisting that they be cleaner, but we probably have to pay for it for the, at the outset. So all of those multiple factors have to fit together in a world that has nobody in charge. So we have to realize that if we don't make deals with other countries, then we're gonna just end up going down, down, down in terms of biodiversity and the safety of our environment. And I think giving away a little bit of sovereignty in order to get back planetary sustainability is a good bargain at twice the price.